All right, so in this tutorial, we're going to be talking about something that is surprisingly confusing, um, volume. Volume is one of the most basic properties of sound, but it happens to be one of the most confusing, enough so so that I actually put off recording this tutorial for a very long time. But the nice thing is, is that in Reaper, we have four really awesome ways to control volume, two of them being incredibly helpful. Um, and we're going to look at those today, all four of them, but especially two of them. We're also going to talk about um, some basic attributes of sound theory and also waveform, what it is, why it is awesome, and how to use it to your advantage. So first of all, as we talk about volume, it's important to understand what sound actually is. And I found this nice little chart, and what they point out here is something that a lot of people actually don't understand about sound, which is that sound is just compressed air. The most, the most vivid way to notice this is to hold your fingers in front of your mouth while you're talking, right? And then say a word with a P or a B, the sort of words that have plosives in them that we're all way too familiar with in radio. If you, when you say a P or a B, if you hold your fingers close enough, you'll be able to hear, or you'll actually be able to feel the compression hitting your finger, that little bit of air. But that's how all sound works. It's just that P's and B's are the loudest, um, most noticeable sounds that we make with our mouths. So in this example, our little snare drum here, right? As you hit the snare drum, you create these waves of high and low compression areas. So it rises and it expands here. This is an area of low compression. Um, so it goes down this way, goes back up this way with each new compression. And this is how sound works, usually through air, sometimes through water or surfaces or other things. But mostly when we're talking about recording, we're talking about air compression. Okay, so what is waveform then? Well, I've got this, uh, I've got this little chart here that I made up, and we're going to talk about some things. Um, what I did is I took a, a screenshot from a song I like by a musician called Deru, who's, uh, whose use of, of sound and dynamics and all the things we're talking about, I think, I think really, really represents some topics really well. Um, so first things first, you're like, Jeff, like, okay, A, why are we in Photoshop? Well, I was taking a, a screenshot. And B, why are there two tracks? And this is something that we'll see a lot as we work on stuff in Reaper. Um, this top track here is what's called the left channel. This bottom track is what's called the right channel. This just is the audio that's going to be played through your left ear. And this is through the right ear in a set of headphones. Um, so just for simplicity's sake, we're just going to look at the left channel um, right now. This is waveform. This is exactly what I was showing you just here, um, except this is a much more zoomed out version of it. Um, this is showing you the areas of compression and um, uncompression, discompression, that are going to be uh, sent as instructions to your speakers um, as far as how to recreate the sound. And the nice thing about waveform is it tells us a lot about the audio that we're looking at. Um, most notably uh, about dynamics. Um, for any of you who are trained in classical music, you're familiar with the um, notation system of this is mezzo forte, this is forte, this is piano. and Incidentally, it turns out that they correspond um, directly to what we're talking about when we talk about waveform. So as you can see, this song starts off quiet, well, kind of quiet, kind of medium, kind of loud, um, and then it's crescendoing into a forte section in the right in the middle of the song, about a minute and a half in, and then as the song fades out, it moves towards piano with a couple loud bursts in here. When we look at waveform, we're really looking at dynamics, um, the volume of what audio you've recorded. So um, let's move on here. Uh, this is this is also just another way of saying amplitude. Um, it's the amplitude of the wave. There we go. Okay. So here is the loudest section of that song, just zoomed in um, right to the loudest section. And what you'll notice is that you've got what's called headroom here. This is the space between the loudest point and the absolute maximum you can have. On the other hand, um, I went ahead and amplified that track um, by, I don't know, like 10 decibels or something like that. And then you can see what's going on here. Um, so in this original example, we've got sound waves, which again are the instructions that are going to be sent to the speaker to recreate the sound you want. And you can see that they, um, 
they have these nice curves in them. An area of low compression, an area of high compression, an area of low compression, high compression. And what's important is that you can see the full waveform. Um, in this example, where the, the song is much, much louder, um, and I amplified it like this, this was not how, how um, they mastered it, you can see those, those areas of high compression and low compression are getting clipped off at the top, and this is what is called clipping, uh, or peaking, where the sound instructions that are being sent to the speaker exceed the maximum amount that the speaker can handle. Um, so in this case, the speaker's moving, 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 and it's expected to jump over to this other point. And that is bad. You're, you're squaring off the, the ends of your sound waves. Um, and it makes this terrible sound um, called digital clipping. Um, digital clipping or digital distortion sounds awful. Um, and that's what you need to know about waveform. Your, your goal is to get it close to the edge, but not quite reaching it. Okay, so let's, let's uh, go ahead and look at some stuff in Reaper. You know what I'm going to do? I, I was messing around with this earlier. I'm just going to uh, go ahead and um, I'm just going to make a new copy of it. Okay, so here's an interview that I did with a friend of mine a while ago. Um, he, When he moves to a new city, he just starts walking on the streets and uh, will walk until he's walked across the entire town, just over the course of the time he's lived in a city. Um, it's an interesting interview. I haven't done with it anything with it um, yet, but... This is the original here, and you'll notice immediately that we have some issues. Um, the primary issue is that everything seems really small. Okay, so we do have these these little peaks where it's it's getting really loud. So let's see what, what's going on over here. Nobody, nobody would care if it, if it was a concrete. So there he is. He's breathing into the microphone. Okay, so this is a common problem that you'll have, is that, that your mic placement was a little bit off, or someone just yell something suddenly or what have you. The first thing we'll notice here is that we have what's called a master meter. Um, and that's what this is down here. I made it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. And what's going to have is going to have four bars here. It's going to have a left, a right, a left, and a right. Um, this blue bar here, this is what's called the peak meter. And this is what's reading um, the loudest part of the audio that's happening at any given time. And you can see that um, as, as he gets as he gets closer to the microphone there, it peaks out exactly at zero decibels, meaning that's the loudest you want to go ever. Um, if it was just a tiny bit louder, you'd hear Care. you'd see here that <laughs> it peaks at a decibel and a half over what it should be. Okay, and you can always just click these lights to dismiss them. So that's the peak meter, and the peak meter is great for noticing <laughs> trouble spots like this, right? Um, this is a hint that I need to turn this part of it down. Okay, and so that's the peak meter, that's the blue lines in the middle. Now, on the other hand, you have these lines off to the side here, and this is what's called your RMS here. This is, um, this is a value that has been averaged out. So all these peaks are happening in real time, you'll notice the RMS value it moves more slowly. And when I mix, I usually try to get the RMS right up for the voices, right up around negative six, meaning that it has six decibels to, uh, to mess around with before you hit the peak. Um, of course, notice that the scale for the peak meter and the scale for the RMS meter are different. Um, so, like I said, we're kind of hovering, you know, in the negative four, or excuse me, negative 18 to negative 12 range for his voice. And I would probably like that a little bit louder. So we have two issues. The first issue I want to address is everything seems a little bit quiet. Um, and the way we could, we could fix that is we could just turn up the master meter. So what do I want? I want about six decibels louder, so I turn it up six decibels. And a couple of streets there we go. south. And you'll notice now that my RMS values are a little bit higher. And it's in someone's backyard. It's great. So there's still a could probably even handle there. a little bit it's more. What do you think? At the school anymore. But it, maybe they'll put it back. So there we go. Roughly about where I want anyway, it. Of so course, the problem with this now is that when that peak happens, it's going to happen with eight decibels more force behind it, which is going to sound terrible. I care if it, was, if it was a concrete that they. And so now we're peaking at eight decibels, which is, is not a good thing to do. So messing with the master meter is not generally the best way to do it. Um, I'm going to show you some more precise ways to, to uh, play with your volume. 
Um, so again, there are four major ways to control your volume in Reaper. We've talked about the master fader, and as we go down this list, we're going to get more and more um, pinpoint precision behind our editing. So um, the next option that you have is you have the track fader. And the track fader is very similar to the master fader, except that you only control it per track. Of course, in this project, we only have one track currently. Um, this would become more apparent if I was like, oh, it's like going to split these off with the S key. I'm like, I'm going to just put this on a separate track so that I can control things better. Um, excuse me here while I just clear this out. OK, so um, if I said I'm just going to put this on a separate track so that I can uh, I can work with this a little bit more precisely and control things via the track fader, I could say, OK, so this is a little bit too loud. Um, so I'm going to pull it down a couple decibels. This guy's a little bit too quiet. And this is the majority of my audio here. Um, so I'm going to say make it louder. This is louder. And this is quieter. All right, so I've named these tracks now. This is this is a pretty bad way to to edit um, audio because if every time you want something louder, you have to put it up on this track. Um, if every time you want something like this, a little bit quieter, you pull it down to this other track. That's kind of a bad way to go. And the reason for that is is that while it's easy to see what you're doing here, if there's subtle changes that you want to make, you don't want to have like 12 different tracks just for your, your interview audio. But it does work, and that's what's important. But I call it the porcelain pig. So again, we're looking for about negative six. No, nobody would care. If it's, it's a little bit too quiet. It's a concrete pig. They wouldn't even come to look but at it. But it doesn't peak. It never peaks, and that's um, important. The, okay. The pork so this, this, is, um, this is nice, though, because if you have major changes you want to make in something, you can make it. Um, the other thing to notice is that this here in the mixer, this um, track, is, is directly associated with a slider up higher in the screen, which I'll show you here. Um, and you can adjust it. Same, same thing. Um, and OK, so that's that. This is not the way you want to edit your audio, though, and I'll show you why. OK, so I'm going to drag that back up there. Actually, I'm just going to delete that and just pull this guy over. Same difference. Um, I'm going to get rid of the second track. All right. So the, the next thing that's really nice about um, it's really nice about Reaper is that you have this other more precise way. So we've talked about master, master faders. We've talked about track faders. And now I want to talk to you about item volume. Um, item volume is really nice. And a lot of people don't even know it exists because it kind of hides out a little bit. What it is, is it's an invisible line at the top of each clip, um, with where this is a clip, this is a clip, this is a clip, etc. It's this invisible line that hangs out right here. And what you can do is you can drag it down if something's too loud. And it affects the volume for that entire clip or item. Um, and you can see it even affects it in the waveform right there. And so in this case, I'd probably want to drag it over a little bit like this, so it's just more precise to the bit that's too loud. Um, drag that over just a little bit, and then I would crossfade those so that it's a subtle transition. And now when we hear that audio... I call it the porcelain pig because nobody, nobody would care if it, was, if it was a concrete pig. They wouldn't even come to look at it. So it's probably a little bit loud still. You can kind of match it up here. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Um, you can kind of match it up here so that it should be about the same volume. But I call it the porcelain pig because... Nobody, nobody would care if it, if it was a concrete pig. They wouldn't even come to look at. So yeah, this this is a, a decent way to make larger scale adjustments, and you can see why it's not great here in this situation. Is because I have to keep on going in here and getting close, and it starts to look messy here with all these fades going on. So I think this is about this. This will work about right. Nobody, nobody would care if it, if it was a concrete pig. They wouldn't even come to look at. And there we have it. It kind of floats around negative six, negative twelve. Um, it's a good level. Um, this is kind of a messy way to do it, like I said, because uh, you you run into um, a lot of messy looking audio and you have the potential to, to mess some stuff up. Um, clip levels, or excuse me, item levels are helpful when you're making larger scale adjustments. Like for example, I could say, for the most part, this is all a little bit too quiet. So I'm gonna grab this line here and then I'm gonna hit shift, which will let me go above zero. And you can just kind of make it all a little bit bigger. Okay, and so, what we're going to talk about for the rest of this episode, though, is the fourth way to adjust volume here in Reaper, and that is with volume envelopes. And volume envelopes are these really poorly named, um, but really powerful ways to adjust 
any of any parameter um, of your audio, any any attribute of your audio. Um, and they're controlled by this really tiny little button here over in the side of your track panel. It's called track envelope slash automation. And when you click that, you get this uh, little window that gives you some options here and lets you show various track envelopes. And an envelope is, like I said, it's terribly named, but what it does is it allows you to control uh, attribute over time. Um, and when you click one, I'm going to show you first with the volume pre effects envelope. When you click one, it brings up this new little window down here. And this is what's called a track lane. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the track lanes is that you can you can have um, you can have your effect here, which in this case is volume um, here separated away from your audio. You can also incidentally move it up to the media lane, which is the default lane that shows all the time, or you can have it down in its own separate window. It's up to you. Um, but the way you do that is also through this upside down check mark here. Move it to the media lane, have it down here. doesn't matter. But the reason the pre effects volume envelope is nice is because when you make adjustments, you get to see the adjustments in real time, just like with the um, item volume. Um, however, unlike the item volume, what you get with a track envelope um, is that you get to make fine adjustments. And so when I hold down the shift key here, I can click, make a point, click, make a point, click, make a point, click, make a point. And you're like, well, what's the point? And I'm like, well, grab the point and pull it around. And you can see that as you pull it, it's going to affect the waveform and make it louder. So you could even like write your name in here if you wanted. doesn't matter. But um, what I can do here is I can make this volume like oscillate wildly up and down, right? Well, I probably won't get the order right anymore. But as they come to me, there's, there's a useless tunnel. So not what we want to do here. But let's go over to our problem spot right here again where he... he breathes into the microphone um they're just constantly building <laughs> tunnels under actually that will do okay so here's a here's a problem spot again you can see the waveform looks really wonky because he's just breathing in there <laughs> tunnels. and what i can do is i can shift click shift click shift click shift click then just drag it without the shift hold it down drag it down and get that audio sounding a little bit more acceptable. Like building <laughs> tunnels under the under the roads. And there we have it. Okay, so another way to use this tool, I'm just going to zoom out and find our other little problem spot over here. Another way to use this tool is instead of using the shift key, use the command key on Mac or the control key on PC. I believe it's command key, but um, I know it's control key for PC. And when you hold down control key, you'll see that your, um, your cursor shifts over to a pencil tool. And what that allows you to do is as long as you're holding down the control key and the left mouse button, you can drag it and just paint it on there like a pencil. Um, in this case, what we want to do is we want to make that level and then just dip it down here for this loud bit until it looks about the same as the surrounding audio. And as soon as the bad bit's done, just pull it up and there you go. Okay, so now instead of being too loud, but he would care if it, if it was a concrete that <laughs> fades it down just right in the nick of time, right? And this is nice because you don't have to split off your audio. You can adjust it as much as you want, whenever you want, and you don't have to worry about crossfading stuff because by default, as you're dragging stuff around, you're going to create smooth curves um, with your mouse, so nothing jumps around too quickly. But he would care. <laughs> so let's see how that looks on the on the meter over here. We've been neglecting the meter. But he would care if it, <laughs> if it was a concrete that they would. Wonderful. Sounds natural. Um, doesn't sound great, but it sounds natural at least, right? Oh, actually, one thing I want to talk about though. Um, so, why are we using pre effects instead of the, the volume envelope? Um, Reaper prefers the volume envelope over the volume pre effects envelope. And the reason for that is. I don't know. I honestly don't know why it does. Um, and okay, but the difference between the two, the difference between the two is this. I'm going to hide the mixer with Control M here, just so we have some more space. Um, I'm going to shrink these down by holding the Control button and using the scroll wheel, um, so that we can see it all at once. Okay, so the difference between these two envelopes is primarily 
that when you use the volume envelope, it will not affect the view of your waveform, although it will make it louder. It's just like uh, using the track volume, um, the track the track fader here. It will change the loudness of your audio, but it won't show you visually on the waveform itself. Um, and this the reason for that will become apparent as you start using effects on your work. But for the time being, just know that the pre-effects will show you in the waveform and the normal volume um, envelope will not. In a future tutorial, I'd like to show you how to change the default action of the V key, because currently the V key is mapped to the volume envelope. So if you hit the V key, it'll show or hide the volume envelope no matter where you are. As far as I know, there's no default, uh, there's no default for volume pre-effects. You will have to go up here in the um, automation window, which is the upside down check mark, and select volume visible, excuse me, volume pre-effects visible, or uncheck it. Either way, if you want to show it or hide it. Um, and that's that. So if you have any questions about volume, how it works, um, if something didn't make sense, or if you want a future tutorial that goes more into depth on this or any other subject, be sure to write down in the comments below um, your thoughts or questions or concerns what have you. In the meantime, though, I think that's going to sum it up for this tutorial. Uh, like I said, if you have questions, write me, uh, subscribe, rate it, share it with your friends, that'd be great. And also, of course, quick plug for my own work. Um, if you like the stuff that you hear on the tutorials, be sure to hit up my website, which is hbmpodcast.com. I produce a show called Here Be Monsters. It's podcasts about fear and the unknown. This is a great new episode. It's about a building, a wacky building out in New York. Um, where uh, Big Smalls used to play um, illegally in the basement. Um, it's a great show. Hit up hbmpodcast.com. Thanks for watching, and um, be sure to stick around. There's going to be some more great tutorials in the future.